and one of the Great Lakes nearby. We can learn about different lakes by looking at a map. There is also much we can learn about rivers. Each of the major rivers is joined by several others. Emptying into the Mississippi, for instance, are the Missouri, the Illinois, and the Ohio. These are all tributaries of the Mississippi. The Mississippi begins hundreds of feet above the ocean and thousands of miles from it. Its water comes at first from Lake Itasca, which is the source of the river. Lakes provide the sources for many rivers. You can locate the source of a river on a map. Maps help us learn about rivers, lakes, and coastlines. What else can a map tell us about physical features? Mountains are physical features. How do you show a mountain on a map? To demonstrate, let's begin not with real mountains, but with a model of a mountain range. On a map, we would not see the mountains from the side, but rather from directly overhead. From this position, it's difficult to judge the height of the mountains. We can get more of an idea of the height by moving our lights to the side, casting more shadows. On a map, we can use shadows, or shading, to indicate mountain ranges. This is used on many simple maps. It tells us that here there are mountains, and here there are mountains. But the map doesn't tell us which mountains are higher. Another problem with shadows is that they don't tell us the height of different areas of level land, as we can show with these blocks. From the side, we can easily see which blocks are higher. But from directly above, it's not so easy to tell. Let's look from the side again and see if we can improve our method. Suppose we color the blocks. We'll use three colors to indicate the different heights. Now, keeping in mind what the colors stand for, when we look down, we can tell which blocks are the highest, which are the lowest, and which are in between. Doing this with a map, using one color for the highest areas, another color for the lowest areas, and a third color for the areas in between, we get an idea of the elevation of the land. We can get a more complete idea by using, instead of three colors, four. Five or six. Using this many colors, we can give a very precise picture of various elevations. This is why most physical maps use several colors to show elevations. On each map, you'll find a legend or key which tells what elevation each color stands for. On this legend, one color stands for elevations over 10,000 feet while another color stands for elevations from 5,000 up to 10,000 feet. On the map, we see that the Rockies are colored to show the highest elevation, while the Appalachians are colored to show the next to highest elevation. So we expect the Appalachians to be somewhat different in appearance from the Rockies, which are several thousand feet higher. Looking at the map once again, we see that there are large areas of still another color. This color stands for one of the lower elevations. So we know that these regions are lowlands, referred to as plains. Some plains are located along coastal areas as along the Atlantic coast of North America. Coastal plains make up only a small portion of the total plains area of North America. Other plains are the central plains, west of the Appalachians. 
Here we find mile after mile of level cropland. Cattle are more likely to be raised on the Great Plains, which are quite level but somewhat higher in elevation. High plains are marked on the map with a different color from the low plains. Other level areas are found farther to the west, but these are not plains. Note the color of these areas on the map. This color, remember, stands for the second highest elevation. Such high level lands are known as plateaus. Plateaus are generally drier, less fertile areas than plains. So this is yet another physical feature we can learn to recognize with a map. A map can help us gain knowledge about elevation, about interior waterways, and coastlines. So practice reading the colors, lines, and other symbols, as well as the words, on a physical map.